Greetings friends, welcome tonight. I've chosen my setting as James Gardens for this video. And I'm going to be discussing this book, The Return of the Dead, by Claude Lecouture, which is Ghosts, Ancestors, and the Transparent Veil of the Pagan Mind. I don't know if you can see the book in this low light. That pic that's the only image included in this book. James Gardens is rel relatively quiet r right now. Apart from a few planes in the sky, it's difficult to escape those. I didn't think there'd be planes flying over this part of the city, but what do you know? My apologies about the rustling noise. I seem to be disturbing the wet grass with my feet. I never knew grass could be so loud. The sound comes and goes during the video, though much of the video is actually free from it. And I'm going to be talking to you tonight about revenants. What is a revenant? I'm not exactly sure where the word comes from, but I'm assuming it comes from the French uh, re revenir, to return. A revenant is someone who returns from the dead. I guess there was that movie with Leon Leonardo Di DiCaprio, The Revenant, and I never really knew what the word meant. And I guess because he was taken for dead. He wasn't actually dead, but he came back seemingly as a dead man. This book by Claude Le Couture focuses mainly on the Middle Ages and the pre-modern period, the, the pagan mindset, the pre-modern mindset, death and dead individuals. It was very different back then, of course. It, there was some blending with Christianity. Christianity uh, adapted in some ways to view how people looked at revenants. What Mr. Le Couture is doing is looking at a lot of the folklore, a lot of the popular stories, not so much mythology, but actual stories which were taken to be real, not just simply mythological. There might be some overlap there, but uh, he's basically looking at the, the folk tale, the popular conscience, uh, with a, some focus on Germany, Switzerland, England, but mainly Scandinavia. Mainly it's Norway, Sweden, and Iceland that gives us the richest story. Something about the Scandinavian culture gives us the richest, very clear language of what happened. This is not like a paranormal uh, investigation that he's doing. He's doing it sort of like an anthropological ethnography with some psychological in interpretation. So I won't be here to prove that these things exist to you from reading this book, uh, but I will be demonstrating that these things were believed in, they were taken as real, and they were part of the popular consciousness. So a revenant, you might say that's similar to a ghost, but the way a revenant was understood was that it was a dead person who has come back in physical form, not as ectoplasm, not as an apparition. It seems that in the medieval period, this sort of notion of the, the specter, the apparition, was not so common as the flesh and blood dead person arising. They would often arise from their grave or their cairn. A cairn is like a you, would, you might see that in some of the northern cultures, like in Scotland, it's basically a pile of stones. It's a tomb. They would rise out of that. They would be animated, uh, often bigger than they were in real life, stronger than they were in real life. So let me just read a few stories from this book. I'm not going to read too much. So this is again from uh, Scandinavia. Then Thorstein Ericsson sent word to his namesake. Master Thorstein, to come to him, saying there was no peace at home because the farmer's wife was trying to rise up and get into the bed with him. When Thorstein entered, she had reached the sideboards of the bed. He took hold of her and drove an axe into her breast. Thorstein Eriksson died near sundown. So we see with this little story that the revenants come back. And I'm going to explain more about why they come back, but usually it's because they're not happy about something. Sometimes there's positive revenants that come back for protection or, 
or to, to give guidance, but generally it's a negative reason they're coming back because something has upset them. They haven't quite left the physical world. It's not like this uh, modern notion where death is just the end, nor is it necessarily the Christian notion where you're, you're, you're gone to heaven or hell or, or purgatory. You are still in this world. You're just different, so to speak. This little story continues. It was not long until the sickness came to Thorstein's house, and his wife, Grimhild, was the first to fall ill. She was a very large woman with the strength of a man, yet she bowed to the illness. Soon after that, Thorstein Erikson was stricken, and both of them lay ill until Grimhild, wife of Thorstein the Black, died. After she had died, Thorstein the Black left the room to seek a plank on which to put her body. Gudrid, the servant, then spoke. Don't be away long, dear Thorstein, she said. He promised to do as she asked. Thorstein Erikson then spoke. Strange are the actions of the mistress of the house now. She's struggling to raise herself up on her elbow, stretching her feet out from the bedboards and feeling for her shoes. At this, Thorstein the Black returned, and Grimhild collapsed that same instant, with a cracking sound coming from every timber in the room. Thorstein then made a coffin for Grimhild's body, and took it away and secured it. He was a large, strong man, and needed to call upon all his strength before he managed to remove his wife from the farm. A lot of the time, the body becomes so heavy, it's like it does not want to be moved. Either because it's just causing problems for people still, consciously, or because it doesn't want, it doesn't want to leave the house, it wants to be buried exactly where, where they died. And, and actually people, according to Mr. Le Couture, people were buried in their houses, in the ground, underneath the door sometimes. Underneath the common area, maybe, because they wanted to be part of the, the homestead. This is, this is a rural life, medieval life, in the pre-modern period. So they would often become very heavy. They would cause many problems. But let, let me continue reading here. This is a different story. Also from Scandinavia. One night, Audun went in search of Thorgils. Gida, his mother, had died in a bizarre fashion causing the flight of the entire household. It should be said that she had witch-like powers. Audun wished to bury her and was looking for help. Thorgils and he went to the farm, built a coffin, and placed Gida's body inside. Let's carry the beer, said Audun. Beer is like a, a platform, you know, for carrying the body. He said, uh, put it in the ground and place over it the heaviest objects we can find because two precautions are always better than one, they encircled the beer with iron bands before starting off. They had barely gotten any distance from the farm when the coffin groaned. The iron bands burst into shards, and Gida emerged. Audun and Thorgils grabbed her, and to hold her, they were forced to use all their strength, and they were both hearty men, incapable of carrying her any further, they burned her body. So this is getting into some of the things you can do with a revenant. Uh, I mean, this is not a walking, talking revenant, but this is, you know, so-called recalcitrant dead, as uh, the author is calling it. And sometimes you have to burn the, the person, destroy them completely. But there are other ways of dealing with revenants, which I'll, I'll discuss. I'll read this last story now. This is from... Western Iceland, it's part of the Eyrbyja Saga. I'm not sure how, how that's pronounced. Eyrbyja Saga, written around 1230. It's a kind of rural chronicle depicting the life of the inhabitants of Cape Thor. The plot basically covers the years 884 to 1031. Thorolf Twistfoot was a wicked man who lived in Hvam. He died seated on his high seat 
let me just interject here. I'm not sure exactly what the high seat was, but it seems to be pretty central in the uh, pre-modern Scandinavian house. I guess it's kind of like a high seat where the man of the house would sit. Thorolf Twistfoot died seated on his high seat and was buried beneath a pile of stones, but he did not rest in peace. Once the sun had set, it was not wise to remain outside. The oxen that had pulled his cadaver became enthralled by sorcery, and any cattle that drew close to his tomb went mad and bellowed themselves to death. Any bird that lit upon his tomb perished instantly. Thorolf slew the shepherd of Havam, who ran into him close to his sepulchre, and the shepherd's body was left black as charcoal with every bone broken. So we can see here that revenants actually killed people back then, at least in the popular consciousness. No one dared pasture any livestock in the valley. It was soon discovered that the common room was haunted. When winter came, Thorolf often appeared at the farm, and when the mistress of the house eventually died, she was buried alongside Thorolf and the shepherd. The people then fled the farm, but Thorolf began haunting the entire valley, and it was soon deserted. He killed men, and it was seen that the dead traveled with him. Yet wherever his son, Armkel, was to be found, Thorolf and his band caused no harm. That spring, Armkel set off with eleven men. They reached Thorolf's cairn, opened it, and found his corpse there, hideous to look upon and suffering no decay. They placed the corpse on a sled, hitched two oxen to it, and carried it up to Ulfarsfell Ridge. Arnkel wished to bury Thorolf farther away at Vadil Shofti, but the oxen went into a panic, broke free of their yoke, and fled into the sea where they perished. Thorolf was so heavy that the men could barely lift him up a nearby knoll, where they buried the recalcitrant dead man. Across the promontory, Arnkel had, had a wall built that was so high none could cross but the birds. Thorolf rested peacefully there as long as Arnkel remained alive. Once Arnkel was dead, however, he resumed his evil wanderings. He killed men and beasts in Bolstad, left the lands of Thorod desolate, then went to haunt Ulfarsfell, where he terrified everyone. Faced with the complaints of the farmers, Thorod gathered his men and they all climbed up to the Revenant's mound. They opened it and found Thorolf there. He still had not decomposed. He was black as hell and fat as an ox. When they tried to move him, they could not even budge him. They removed him from the tomb with the help of a lever, then rolled him to the riverbank where a pyre was built. They put the cadaver inside, though it proved difficult to burn. When the fire caught, a great wind scattered his ashes to various locations. The men cast them into the sea and returned home. A cow often went down to the bank where Thorolf had been cremated, and she licked the stones upon which ashes were still scattered. A mysterious dapple gray bull mounted the cow which gave birth to a large dapple gray calf. When Thorod's wet nurse heard this beast bellow, she was terrified and said, Those are the howls of a monster, not a living being and requested on several occasions that the animal be killed. Thor Thorod refused, and one day the calf killed him." The mentioning of the dapple grey is supposedly a paranormal uh, significance. The, the dapple grey color is associated with the other world. So you have to remember, as I said, the revenant was like a so tied to the land. Often, if you hadn't respected their wishes, Maybe you have not respected their tomb, and their tomb was desecrated, or you didn't, you didn't uh, respect their wishes to be buried with a certain item that they wanted, like their shoes, because they would need these items in the next world. Kind of like in ancient Egyptian beliefs. They, they believed they had to be buried with certain things for use, maybe to pay certain toll gates. They believed in uh, not exactly hell in the pagan worldview, but there were there were different places. Like there was there was Valhalla. There were these different places, and to get there, you often had to cross rivers. You had to you had to pay people who guarded bridges. You have to cross over a large expanse, and you'd need so you'd need your shoes for that. And if you're not buried with those items, then you cannot rest in peace. You may not find what you're looking for, and you have not exactly left this world. The revenant might come back 
it might be in a peaceful way to impress upon the living to rectify the situation. The church incorporated some things into making these people sinners, like, oh, they sinned. A lot of stuff had to do with land, dishonestly marking land, so you were basically stealing land by changing the marking stones. That was something that, you know, was very sinful, and then that was interpreted as producing a revenant because they couldn't find peace because they were damned. So there was, there was this blending of the Christian theology with the pagan uh, Germanic Scandinavian cultural beliefs. Revenants often claim to be burning, I'm burning, please go to the church and say prayers for me or, or, or donate something in my name so I can find peace. This connection to the land, they're associated with what Le Couture calls the third function, which is fertility, the, the agricultural productivity of the land. If their wishes are not met and you have this uh, recalcitrant dead, you may not have fertile land anymore. And on the positive side, if you honor your ancestors, then they are associated with protecting your homestead, and making sure the harvests are good, making sure it, it rains. I'm not sure, I'm not saying I believe all of this, but this was very much psychologically real for people. But I do, I do believe there's an element of truth in this. The most fascinating thing to me is that these revenants were physical, corporeal beings. We think very logically in, in our materialist thinking, and it's, it's hard for me. How, how can this happen? How can a dead person just get, come out of the ground? They speak of them coming out of the ground, often bigger than they are, often extremely tall, extremely strong, sometimes black as charcoal, with more powers. Not just in terms of strength, but like psychic powers almost like they become sorcerers. Some of these people were bad people in, in life, don't get me wrong, they, they were often taciturn, bitter people. Often the, re the revenants were social outcasts. So it's not entirely surprising that you know, sorceresses, witches, wizards are in some cases more likely uh, to come back. But it seems that in other cases, people who were not sorcerers also come back as revenants and they have these powers which are akin to sorcery. And there also is necromancy. People could be, at least in the, in the understanding back then, in the folk tales, necromancy was something that happened. He doesn't go into too much detail about necromancy in the book, but necromancy is basically using so sorcery to summon the dead back to life so that they can give you some information, so that they can do something for you. They can often predict the future, tell you what's going to happen, but it seems that the dead really don't like this. They do not like being summoned. They, it's like the necromancy is forcing them. It's not like inviting them to come up. It's like, no, you have awoken me and I'm not very happy about it. And sometimes the person doing the necromancy would also die. They would be destroyed by this. And that's what's interesting about the, the revenants is it's not that they're just there to uh, teach you a lesson. Sometimes they, they spread death. It's like death is contagious. And of course, back then, before the understanding, of, modern understanding of diseases and bacteria, there might be some parallel there. You know, dead bodies can spread germs. Um, but there was this almost spiritual de de um, definition, like spiritual association of death with contagion. And they, they, they could not bring dead bodies straight to the grave by crossing farmers' fields. They had to keep the body on roads. They had to keep, you know, moving it in a zigzag fashion because any, anything the dead body touches could be compromised, could decay as well, could be, could be fated to die as well. The sight of revenants often was an omen of more death coming. I think if you saw in these, these stories I did re read for you, many people were, were killed by these revenants and even, even joined them. The main thing is this connection to the land, which I find very interesting because, of course, we've lost that in our current age. The dead are removed. We die in hospitals or hospices. Even in the cemeteries, which we do, you know, still have, they are removed from the homestead there. People were buried on their land back then, as I said, as I mentioned, even in the house, even under the door frame. Back to what I was saying about how the dead were contagious. You had to remove them from a house in a certain way. Sometimes you had to remove them through a hole in the wall. You couldn't remove them through the front door. This is different, but if you were still alive, but your family had believed that you had been killed. In some cultures, like in ancient Rome, maybe in parts of Germany, you were expected to 
when you reappeared, you had to enter your, your homestead through the roof. Otherwise, you might be cursed to die early. Yeah, it's quarter to midnight on uh, Wednesday, May 15th. It's been a cool, cool spring. Very cool. See my breath there. Spring in Canada is, is a cool season. It's not really that warm. We're like five weeks away from June 21st. Longest day of the year, and it's, I'm, you know, I'm wearing two sweaters and a jacket right now. Some uh, birds are getting a little, ex there's a full moon, practically a full moon shining down on me. That's not the light I have here. That's not the moon, but the moon is behind it. And uh, not really any wind right now, which is pretty cool. What were the traditional ways of killing a revenant? Often they had to be physically fought. Of course, the church would later get involved in the, you know, like holy water or, or saying prayers or crosses. This, like, this could perhaps play some role in dispelling the revenants. Also in dispelling uh, spirits in stones and trees. Like, they were so, like, the revenants are in some fashion associated with giants, elves, and dwarfs. I'm not exactly sure how they're associated. Elves and dwarves and giants are sort of like the, in the other world. So if you're going into the other world, you might be following a dwarf. If you're coming back from the other world, from the world of the dead into the world of the living, you might be accompanied by a giant. The giants were supposedly the primordial beings around a, the first creation, and from their essence was fashioned the earth. Uh, I'm not saying I necessarily believe that. Although the, the Bible does speak of giants, like physical, real giants, existing in the past. So there's some interesting parallel there. And then the elves, you know, they're all, they're kind of like nice, like in Lord of the Rings, these guys are depicted as, as good. They're on the good side fighting the orcs, but I don't know, in the old pagan literature, it seems like elves were associated with illness. Dwarves were uh, often dangerous. Uh, like elf, there were expressions like the elf on you would be like meaning the illness in you. I'm listening. There's a very strange sound. Do you hear that? Oh, it must be a train. It must. Okay, it's a it's a train, but it's way up. Okay. You know, it's, it's, it's laid out. It's laid out. There's, there's, not, there's not too many people around here. There's a tale of this king following a dwarf into a cave where he has a hall and, and he feeds him well. And the king goes into the cave with a retinue of 50 men, 100 men. And then the dwarf leads them out of the cave and gives them this dog saying, don't dismount from your horses. Because the king was on a horse. All his men were on. How, they, how you fit a horse into a cave that's another question, but you know, this is the story. Maybe it was a big cave. A few men get down from their horses after getting out of the cave and they turn into dust. That was because they didn't wait for the dog to come down. But then the king re realizes that they've been in the cave for like 200 or 300 years. Rip Van Winkle, that sort of story. When you enter the world of the elves or the dwarves, time is not like it is here. And you could emerge from that world like you haven't felt any different, like you haven't felt the time going by. But actually time's been flying by. But then they, they were basically fated to, similar to a state of death, because they can never get, the dog never comes down. They're fated to run, you know, constantly march around in their retinue for all eternity. And that's similar to these bands of dead, these bands of revenants. Revenants are not always isolated. Sometimes they, they march around in groups, in hunting groups, or in, in processions, there's this other uh, tale of the, uh, the the revenants at a church saying mass. Some of them are sinners, or it's not really known why. And then uh, they, uh, this one lady goes to the church by mistake. She's the only one that's not dead. And then she realizes that everyone here is dead because it's midnight mass near Christmas. But she runs away. The dead see her. They pursue her, but she manages to get away. That's not exactly like a procession of dead, but you know, they, I'm just saying they, they appear in groups, they come together sometimes. So what were traditional ways of killing a revenant? Well, not killing a revenant, you might be able to restore its dignity, help it find salvation. Don't disrespect its tomb or its cairn or its grave. It, if it doesn't want you laying dirty laundry on its grave, stop doing that. 
So that's not, that's not a way to kill it, but it's a way to bring peace. However, let's say it's a stubborn revenant. Let's say it was just a really bad person, a bad soul, and it wants to continue doing what it's doing, even worse now, even kill you, even kill your family, drive everyone out of the valley. There are things you can do. You can cut off its head, as you may have seen in the stories I read for you. You dig up the grave, look at the body. The body should not be decomposing. If the body is decomposing, then maybe it's not a revenant. Maybe a decomposing body can still be a revenant. I'm not saying for sure. Maybe they can still reanimate themselves. But if the body is not decomposing, then you know for sure you're dealing with a revenant, because any body should decompose, unless it's been artificially treated somehow. So you have to cut off its head, place the head at the, at the feet. That would work a lot of the time. Not all the time, though. Sometimes you have to strike it with iron, stri like in striking it with an iron axe, driving a stake into the grave, binding the corpse, binding the feet of the corpse, perhaps the, the, the arms, to bi physically binding it, closing the eyes of the dead body. This is something we still do today. We sh you should do that, at least. It's very unsettling if a de dead person is just looking at you. That's why we close the eyes. That's actually before you have a revenant problem. You should be doing that anyways. But Exhuming the corpse and burying it in wasteland, far away, off of your farmland, away from everyone, in a no-man's land, in a wasteland, because if they cause the soil to be awful, then you're not, it's no loss anyways, because it's wasteland. And besides fighting it physically, or using uh, holy water, crosses, Christian prayers, inv invoking God under the power of angels, then you have to burn the body, cremation. I think that's one reason why people like cremation today, because if there is, I do believe, of course, there is a soul that could hang around after death, and if you see that your body's gone, Less reason to hang around here. There's like this attachment of the revenant to its body. There's no exact explanation in this book. It's an ethnography, it's a cultural understanding, but the way I interpret this thing is, it's like the person's dead, but they're not dead. They're alive. Like, how can that be? It's, well, it, well they're physically dead, but it's like they're, they're, you know, it's like zombies. It's like they're dead, but something is pulling them up like a marionette. That's the spirit which is trying to get back into the body, and it can't quite do it perfectly, so it's kind of manipulating the body, so the body can jerk, the body can move, it can open its mouth, it can even, sort of, be like a living person, only not quite. That's more of the zombie interpretation. In other interpretations, they're just like, they were in, in, in life. That's more of the positive interpretation, like the mother coming back to comfort her, lo her, her children, who, are, who have mourned her loss, and she just comes back and they just accept her. And there's no, there's no rational uh, explanation, but there's, they're not questioning it. They, it makes perfect sense for them. Those are basically the ways to uh, get rid of the revenant. But the most important thing is, has the cultural tradition been respected? If the person did good in life, did you do respect to them after their death? And if they were a bad person, well, then you might have to resort to some of these more strict measures to make them sh see that they have to accept their fate. One interesting thing, there are some barriers against revenants. Apparently hedges, they don't like hedges. So if you're being tracked by a revenant, there's three basic barriers that may not always work. The domain, the household, they don't like to cross walls into the domain. They may do so however it could happen, but they're less likely to cross a wall into the domain into your homestead. They like the outside. They like to rap on the roof. They like to bang on the door. They like to run around your house. Stay in the tree line, in the darkness, out there. But they will not like to cross hedges. There's something about hedges that has a spiritual protection. Again, this is just coming from the book. I can't vouch for this personally. And also rivers, streams, bodies of water. They do not like to cross the water. So if you're running away from a revenant, your best bet is to get behind a hedge, get behind a, on the other side of a stream, and best of yet, get into your house with the lights on, with the fire going, with other people around. Probably you should have a Bible with you and you should be have a cross with you. You should be reading the Bible. You should be saying something that you know is a, is a holy verse. 
designed to dispel, I was going to say demons, and I know in the past I've said most of these things are demons, but in this case, let's just say a malignant soul to dispel them. I don't actually believe that revenants could just be killing all these people if these people weren't susceptible for some reason. There must be some cultural explanation, some psychological explanation. I'm not, I'm not reducing it to culture and psychology. No, I do believe there is some manifestation. I do find it hard to believe how physical they describe it. But I do at the same time believe it's not just that simple. They can't just kill a good person out of the blue. Or can they? Maybe I'm wrong because of, based on the literature, that's, that could happen, so. Revenants could apparently tear people to pieces, especially shepherds, especially people out, out alone like myself right now. It is 12.01 a.m., Thursday, May 16th. One other thing is that they sometimes come in dreams. You will sometimes see dead people in dreams. This can be a positive thing. Your loved ones who have passed sending you a message, giving you guidance. So I know most of the focus here is on the negative revenants, but there are positive revenants. There are also false revenants. That's one thing I forgot to mention. Because this belief in revenants, this reality of revenants, goes back way into the pagan past, even some of the later authors who weren't yet fully Christianized, and then those who were fully Christianized, they, they took this literature and they switched stuff around they often called stuff trolls. I've mentioned the giants and the dwarves, but trolls or giants where really they were confusing a word. They were interpreting the name for revenants or the word for revenants incorrectly. They were helping to dispel this belief in the corporeal returned dead and transmuting it into these fantasy creatures. In some of these accounts where it's, oh, it was a troll, or oh, it was some giant, it's like, no, actually, the way, you look at how the thing is behaving, you look at the behavior, where can it go, when does it come back, and the behavior fits that of a revenant. Revenants also come at night, or well, they can come in the day, mostly at night, mostly in the short days of the year, especially around Christmas, which in those pagan days was called Yol, J-O-L. Yol or, or Jo, I'm, I'm assuming it was pronounced Yol or something like that. Around that time, the short days, the darkness. This pagan mindset basically, it did not view living and death as strictly separate. They were basically part of the same world. Like I said, in the tomb, you were assumed to be sleeping in your tomb. People wanted to be buried in certain places, like I mentioned the homestead, but also by the seashore. I want to watch the ships come and go. I want to be buried next to so-and-so, so we can talk, so we can keep each other company. Tomb raiding. Go down into a tomb and you are literally assaulted by the dead man. He's trying to swing his axe at you. You have to do battle with him to get his treasure, which is kind of disrespectful. But, but I guess through doing that battle and probably chopping his head off, you prove yourself worthy and then you're able to get his gold. Sort of getting into this notion of reincarnation, a revenant can send messages to someone to name this child after me because they're going to be born soon. And when that child is born and you name them, then the dead person's soul becomes that person in a type of reincarnation. I don't necessarily believe that. I haven't heard of any Christian explanation of a lot of these things. So I think that I still believe in heaven and hell and all this stuff, but I don't see that that's necessarily saying that there can't be souls wandering around on earth. I don't know about physical bodies coming up back up. Also, these physical bodies, when you slash at them, when you slash at a revenant, it's described as going through water. So, so they might not be entirely physical. They look physical, but when you're, when you're cutting into them with that sword, it's like slow, like going through water, and you can't really kill them that way. And sometimes like animals will be coming up in their spirit, like the seal head will be coming up through the, your house and you, they'll be bashing the seal on the head and it'll go back down into the earth. And meanwhile, you're fighting this revenant outside. You're chasing it, fighting it, you're getting bruised. And then when the revenant falls back, it will sink into the ground. It's like the ground is this ocean that they, they come up from and they sink back down into. So they're not just limited to where their grave is. Yeah, if you're fighting a revenant, but you haven't completely dispelled it, and you go 
back to its grave in the daytime and you dig it up, it will have the same injuries uh, in, that you inflicted on it during your last combat with it. There's probably more things I could say. If you want to know more about ghosts, spirits, or demons, I highly recommend you check out John Razimus on YouTube. I'll put a link to his channel in the description. I need to be on my way. I hope you learned something. Hasta luego amigos! Actually, this tree where I just filmed my video was dedicated in loving memory of Sean Patrick Kelly, January 2nd, 73 to September 9th, 92. So he died when he was like 19. Loving son, brother, friend, RCI, Richview Collegiate Institute student, always in our heart, love mom. So that just goes to show you that's the, sort of the best thing we can do for our dead these days is build a tree or uh, plant a tree. But it's, it's removed from the living. It's way out here. Way out here in the park. Nice park though. Just thought I would show you where I've been filming. Here's my, uh, I set up my bike here and I set up, see I set up my, uh, my headlamp there on the tree. And I was just standing uh, facing east, I guess. It's kind of just a big park here. There's trees, but you can't really see them because they're in the distance. It's kind of uh, some. It's over here. Has there anyone been listening to my story? Hello? Anyone listening? Hello? 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 Is there anyone there? the moon. <sighs> Grass is soaking wet. My feet are soaked. Not quite, but 